Thank you so much for coming. I am especially glad to see lots of return visits from people from previous sound waves. And welcome to all the children who are here. Uh, I think we're all going to learn a lot. I know I am. So let me, my name is Dan Graboy. I'm the curator of the series. And I would like to tell you what I know about color. Rods and cones, <laughs> primary colors, and you can mix them. Uh, I'm running a little low here. A prism separates white light somehow into its component colors, whatever that means. And that's pretty much it. But I will say, I am a musician. I do not have perfect pitch, but I have a very special skill. I have perfect color memory. So when I look at somebody in an orange shirt, I remember that, that color orange right away. Likewise, a blue shirt, I think blue, and I can remember it. And I think you all have that same skill. We recognize color instantly. We all agree, for the most part, on colors. I have no idea why. I'm hoping we're going to learn. We have a brilliant panel of scientists, artists, and musicians. So let's start learning about color. Thank you very much. color in a moment. Right, the microphone is in. So what is color in the first place? Well, two things. One is the physical color. And that means that every color we see with our eyes is associated with one wavelength of light. And vice versa, for every wavelength, there is one color. So that's a really simple definition of color. There really isn't very much else to know about color. Having said that, the way we see color, so the color we perceive, is quite a bit more complicated. And it's very interesting to actually notice that there are uh, three kinds of receptors in our retina. And we are going to hear all about them from Tom Yin later tonight. But uh, what I want to share with you is some artifacts and some interesting correspondence of our eye physiology and the physics of color. So let's get started. If I could have the lights dimmed. When we make white light go through a projector, a white light projector, we make it go through a prism. The prism disperses the colors of white light. And that's what you're seeing here. I apologize. So uh, that's what you are seeing here. The colors that go from red to violet that um, all together added up form white. Where are they added up? They are added up in our eye. And this is what I hope to share with you tonight. So if we have, let me do it slightly differently. So if we have a red filter in front of a white light projector, it's going to transmit red light. And in fact, if I take it out, you see that the light is white. If I put it in front of it, you see that the light is red. What's going to happen if I put it in front of this prism? There, you see that only red is going through. There's a tiny bit of orange, but by and large, it's only red. You notice in particular that there is no yellow no green, no blue going through. It's only red. Now I remove it, I put it back where it came from, and I'm going to switch on another projector where I have a green filter. And now I'm going to show you that there really isn't anything else other than green. Well, there's a tiny little bit of uh, blue there, but not much. And then what's going to happen if instead I overlap the place on the screen where these two projectors are projecting their red light We've seen it's only red. Their green light, we've seen it's only green. What's going to happen? A third color is going to appear. Who wants to guess what color that will be? Blue. No, quite. Yellow. Hold on a second. Didn't I just say that there was no yellow? I showed you. No yellow? No yellow? Yellow. What's going on? Who am I fooling here? Well, 
we're looking at two entirely different kinds of yellow. This is physical yellow, spectral yellow, with the actual yellow wavelengths. Here, there are no yellow wavelengths. As I just demonstrated to you, there are red wavelengths, there are green wavelengths, there are no yellow wavelengths. So how does this work? How come we see yellow? Well, this is how it works. With these three types of cones that we have, and now I'm cheating, but only a tiny little bit. Instead of showing you a broad band red and, and green filter and the response of our eye to them, I'm going to show you two very sharp single wavelength lines, like the green laser that um, uh, many laser point, uh, pointers have, and the red laser that of this particular laser pointer that I'm using now. And those have single wavelengths that you can see. 532 is green, and 633 nanometers is red. What happens when we look at these laser pointers or, or light of these colors? Well, this is going to elicit a response on this type 3 cone of 8, whereas 532, which is green, is going to elicit the response on types 2 and type 3, which are respectively 17 and 9. The eye adds up these things. And so that 9 and that 8 are going to be added to one another, and their sum is 17. So the eye is seeing that type 1 sees 0, type 2 sees 17, and type 3 sees 17. And what is that color? which um, has 0, 17, and 17. And the answer is yellow. And in fact, it's another wavelength that's a physical yellow wavelength of 570 nanometers that has 0, 17, and 17 on the, team, on the three types of cones. This is why we see that as yellow. So yellow or red and green look exactly the same to us because they, they provoke the same response from our eye and from our brain. So now I have a question for you. Instead of telling you everything, I want to know from you what's the complementary color to red. And I want you to be vocal about this. Come on, what's the complementary color? There are quite a few discrepant opinions, and I didn't hear the right one from anybody. I heard blue, I heard green. Let's see what it is. OK. Red, if we look at the transmittance curve of a red filter, and we take the spectrum, and we actually divide it into three regions, roughly between 4 and 500 nanometers of wavelength, between 5 and 6, and 6 and 700, we're going to be calling those the blue region, the green region, the red region. So a, a red filter absorbs, takes all the light that starts with equal intensity in the red, the green, and the blue region, and it absorbs in the blue region, it absorbs in the green region, so the spectrum is zero transmittance there, and transmits quite a bit of the light in the red region. This is what makes a red uh, filter red, OK? It absorbs blue and green. A green filter, much the same story, except that it's not zero in the green region. Same story when we look at, I'm having issues with the clicker. <laughs> OK, with the blue filter. And they are complementary colors. They are complementary colors are cyan, magenta, and yellow. Let's look at it. What's a complementary color? It's the color that, yeah, bravo, so yeah, <laughs> complementary to red. So when you add two complementary colors, and you add lights, not pigments, not paints, you add lights of those two colors, you form white. And so what you do, if you add one that's high, high, low, to low, low, high, you're going to have high everywhere. You add them up. You see that this is like flipped upside down to obtain that. And the same goes for green and magenta, blue and yellow. These are the complementary colors. In fact, we can look at them, all three added. And you can see here, I'm going to have to take out a little bit of the red. You can see that when we add all three of them, of these primary colors, red, green, and blue, RGB, 
when we add all of them, we have white at the center. Red is complementary to cyan, because when we add cyan to red, we obtain white. Magenta to green, we obtain white. Blue to yellow, we obtain white. But this is all very complicated, and I'm a physics professor, and you know people are skeptical, and so on and so forth. And let's see if you can convince yourselves with your own eyes. Not because I tell you, or because this experiment tells you that these are the complementary colors. Let's see if it works for your own opinion. Look at this flag, and specifically look at the X sign at the center. You're welcome to move your body, you can move your face, you can move your head, but don't move your gaze. Keep your gaze stuck on that X for quite a few seconds as I speak and walk you through this. The next thing that's going to happen is that I'm going to change the slide and move. And the next slide is going to have that same X at the center, but the flag is not going to be there. It will be entirely white. So after you've been looking at the flag for quite a few seconds, your um, the neurons in your retina will become adjusted to that particular color, adapted to that particular color in every specific location of your retina. So it, as long as you keep looking at the X, wherever you are seeing red in the flag, you are no longer going to be seeing red. So when I switch to a white screen, you will still see a flag. And what color is it? Where we look at it where it was red, Ah, damn this clicker. <laughs> I apologize, this is awful. <laughs> OK, so there we go. OK, this and that is what I want to do. OK, so please keep looking at the X for me. So when it's red, it becomes cyan, because you suppress the perception of red, and now you see cyan, which is the complementary color. So you, when your eye does not see red, it will see the complementary color. Keep looking at the X. I am now going to go forward. Where the flag is blue, you see yellow, the complementary color. Where the flag is white, you see black, the complementary color. Stars and stripes are black. OK, so one last thing I wanted to tell you, and it is that the color that we perceive also depends on the surrounding color. So I now want to show you orange, very nice orange circle. Kind of looks like an Olafur Olafsson painting. Um, there we are, that's orange. Very few doubts about that. What color is this? I'm dimming it. What color is this? Orange. We all agree that it's still orange. Yet, if I turn on a bright disk or a bright corona of white light around it, that's undoubtedly brown. Why is this? Because the color that we perceive depends on what's around it. Not so much the color, but actually the brightness of the color. The psychophysical perceived brightness depends on, um, so if I go bright, it's definitely orange now. I open the, the, um, an aperture in front of this projector. I'm going to go down all the way to black. And same happens if I remove the orange filter. It happens with white, gray, and black. So the color you see at the center is strongly influenced by what you see all around. But not only. In fact, it doesn't only work on color, it works with black and white and grays as well. In fact, if you look at this brilliant illusion that was created by um, Ed Edward Adelson at MIT, you see this is a, a, it's called the brightness paradox because if you look at this checker labeled A and this other checker that's labeled B, you see that those appear to be completely different shades of gray, yet they are exactly the same shade of gray. So thank you. So uh, having said this, I actually had some fun with it. And I started covering parts of it. And when I remove everything from around it, I hope I convinced you that those are indeed exactly the same shade of gray. 
So what did I teach you thus far? What did I share with you thus far? That the physical color is different in very many cases from the perceived color. That's obviously not true when we are only looking at physical colors, like in the spectrum that I showed through the prism. But in all other cases, it can be quite a bit different. The second thing I mentioned is that the complementary colors are red, green, and blue, cyan, magenta, and yellow, in that order. Please remember it. It's really easy. RGB is the most frequently pronounced sequence. I've never heard anybody saying BGR. So RGB is really easy. And CMY is also pretty easy. That's how you buy the color cartridge of your uh, color printer, right? So remember them. The first goes with the first, the second with the second, the third with the third. So it's really easy to remember. The last thing I mentioned is that the color that we perceive depends on the color that's around it. In case you have further questions or if you'd like to do some further reading, please do ask me. Please uh, let me know. And uh, I happen to have written a book co-authored with Willie Haberly, who taught me everything I know uh, in, uh, uh, about, about communicating with people. And um, uh, this is not shameless advertisement <laughs> to sell the book. <laughs> Because we make just a few pennies. It's just a very inexpensive book. And we make a few pennies. And if you buy it used on Amazon, we don't make any money. So please do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm Rodney Schreiner. I'm from the chemistry department. If you look at your program, you'll see that the chemist comes between the physicist and the neuroscientist, which is exactly the right place from my point of view, because I think of chemistry as the central science. <laughs> its roots go deep into physics, and its supporting branches hold up the life sciences. But I need to get my uh, set arranged here, so I'll roll things into position. Because one of the things that got me interested in chemistry is color. And in my chemistry laboratory, there is a lot of color. Well, actually, I'm exaggerating. In my uh, laboratory, there are lots of bottles that look like this. Solutions of various chemicals, you know, of nearly all the substances that chemists have identified, nearly all of them are colorless. They look like this. But then there are a few exceptions. They really stand out on the shelves. And I want to show you one of my very favorites. It's this one. I think that's one of the most beautiful blues that there is. That's copper sulfate. This is sodium sulfate. What makes that blue? Copper sulfate, sodium sulfate. Is it the sulfate? No. no. Must be the other part, the copper part, right? And that's what uh, we chemists have a name for the substance or the part of the substance that carries the color. We call it chromophore. And that just is Greek for color carrier. Now, one of the things that we can learn from color is here's a whole bunch of other solutions of copper sulfate. And they're all the same blue, right? But they have slightly different intensities. Or in some cases, it's not really slightly different. It's quite a bit different. And the reason they're different is because it is the concentration that is different between these. This bottle has a higher concentration of copper sulfate than that one. I'd have to read the labels to see what. This one is one molar. Remember moles from chemistry? It is a measure of the amount in a certain volume. This is two tenths. So this is one fifth the concentration of that. This, I think, is one tenth. Yes, that's, this is. Uh, half the concentration of that, and this is 0 0.01. So this is a tenth the concentration of that. And this is, uh, the intensity of color is a tool that chemists can use to figure out what the concentration of something is. It's called colorimetry, measuring color to determine the concentration of something. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that 
everything that contains copper is blue. And so I'm going to do something with one of these to show you that. I am, after all, a chemist, and chemists like chemical reactions. So I am going to show you a reaction using some of this copper sulfate solution. I pour some of that in here. So in this solution, there are two components, copper sulfate and water. The copper and the sulfate are dispersed in the water, and the copper is surrounded by water. But if I add something to it which uh, has a preference over water for the copper, something might happen. I'm going to add chloride ions. Those are the ions that are in sodium chloride, table salt, but I'm not using table salt because I can't get enough chloride in using table salt. I'm going to use hydrochloric acid. I can get much more chloride. So if I add that, the chloride ions push the water molecules away, and the copper changes color. Went from Yes, please? Blue, Blue to green. green. See, I'm looking down at it, and it doesn't look quite that much different. But, oh yes, it's green. So this uh, change in color, this, the dependence of the surrounding on the substance, uh, how that affects its color, is something that you have all seen. Let me see if I can bring this up here. That's Poopa slides. I want mine. Hello. There we go. Mine is there. Oh, that's my title. I'm not terribly good at Max. I'd like to use a single key stroke, but it doesn't work on here. See, it doesn't. Uh, where is slideshow? There it is. Play from start. Okay. That's my title. You know what it is. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to show you very soon what color can tell you. But at the moment, I want to show you this. Uh, these are two gemstones, picture of two gemstones. Uh, what's that one? Ruby. Looks like a ruby. It is a ruby. It's a picture of a ruby. And that one looks like an emerald. It is. It's a picture of an emerald. Both of those get their color from the very same chemical substance. It is chromium, the element chromium makes rubies red, and it makes emeralds green. The reason it's different color is because the surrounding is different. The ruby is made of corundum, the surrounding body, which is aluminum oxide, and the emerald is beryl, which is beryl beryllium aluminum silicate. So the surrounding has a tremendous effect on the color of a substance. And I'm now going to use that fact to show you some things that you can find. I shouldn't put these aside, should I? I put them on to start working with the source of color. I'm going to derive a chromophore from a vegetable. What is this vegetable? Cabbage. It's a cabbage. Or what kind? Red cabbage, some people call them purple cabbages. Uh, it looks more purple to me than, uh, <laughs> than red. Uh, some Germans call them Blaukraut, blue cabbage. And uh, you'll, sign, you'll see fairly soon why that is the case. But I need to extract color from the cabbage, and I'll do that with a blender, to chop it up to get it small enough to fit in the blender, and I will need to plug the blender in, otherwise nothing at all is going to happen. And it also works better if I put some water in there. And it works really much better if I put a lid on it. 
<coughs> Otherwise, we will end up with cabbage everywhere. Ooh. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Let's try to get that down in there. This is my Martha Stewart impression. <laughs> I used to say Julia Child, but uh, that dates me tremendously. Okay, there. Now we have something which we all love. Cabbage smoothie. <laughs> you know, I don't really want the cabbage, I just want this red colored liquid. So I'll strain out most of the solid. That could drip in there. And I want more liquid because I plan on doing lots of stuff with it. So there we go. We're talking color here. What color is that? That is purple. Okay, let's put that one on the end because that's the original color. And let's get these other things out of the way because I'm going to use some more of this juice. It smells pretty good. And I'm going to add something to it. If you ever uh, follow a recipe for cooking red cabbage, it will frequently ask for this stuff. And if you have followed that recipe, you know what's going to happen, right? When I mix vinegar with red cabbage, the juice becomes red. But there are all sorts of stuff around the house that you can mix with, uh, here, let me set this here so we can keep track of what it is that I just used. There are all sorts of things around the house that you can use. Another one. More purple juice and <coughs> this stuff. That's ammonia. You probably have this for washing windows or doing laundry. It's a cleaning product usually. And I will add it and see if it does something. It does. Look at that. It's quite different. It's quite different. Now we have green. Let's try a few more things here. I think I'll just fill a bunch of glasses with juice and try adding all sorts of things. Nice supply of juice and a, quite a collection of things back here. Okay, what do I want next? Ah. <coughs> Lemon juice. Some recipes for uh, cabbage, red cabbage, call for lemon juice. So you probably know what to expect. And let's make room for it over here where the pink is. Pink, lemon juice. My jug of ammonia is a little too big to put up there, so we'll have to remember that that one was ammonia. Uh, let's see. You don't have to use liquids only. You can use uh, solids, too, as long as they dissolve. And you all know baking soda dissolves. So I shall add some baking soda. And yet another color, a color we haven't seen before. There, baking soda. Uh, there's another kind of soda which you might have around the house. This, washing soda. Never mix it up with baking soda. Your cake <laughs> will taste terrible. Now, it's meant for cleaning things. We've used something before that uh, is used for cleaning, namely the ammonia. 
So perhaps that's what will happen to the color here. And sure enough, it's pretty close, isn't it? Yeah. Not exactly the same, but very close. Uh, let's see. I have two more things here to try. Uh, this one is sealed very tightly because uh, <coughs> Children should not be able to get into this, and sometimes adults shouldn't either. This is drain cleaner, solid drain cleaner, uh, which is, as the label says, lye, 100% lye. And we'll put some of that in here. This is also a cleaning. And there it is, green, but it's uh, going a bit beyond the green. OK, one left and one more. This stuff. Philips, no. Just Milk of Magnesia. No brand names here. <laughs> Just Milk of Magnesia. Magnesia. I, this is a suspension of magnesia, which is an old-fashioned name for a chemical which I would call uh, magnesium hydroxide. It doesn't dissolve in water very well, so it makes uh, uh, the slurry when you shake it. And I'll pour it in. And I may need to stir it because it sinks to the bottom. It, too, is sort of green. So it sort of belongs over in here someplace. Like that, maybe? OK, now we've added all sorts of things to this cabbage juice. And uh, we've got a range of colors. We've got some that are similar over here and some that are similar over there. Uh, do these two substances, which turn the cabbage juice bright red, do they have anything in common besides turning the cabbage juice bright red? Something you can taste. They're both sour, right? Okay, they're both sour. And these over here, if you get them on your fingers, what do they feel like? They feel kind of slippery. So these substances that change the juice green or blue, give you a slippery feel on your fingers. The ones that turn it red, you have a sour flavor. Those are the kind of symbol or kind of things that scientists look out for. Those are the things we really want to find, is where two properties go together always, but they don't seem to have any obvious connection. One of them, the red color, is something you sense with your eyes. One of them, the sour flavor, is something you taste with your mouth. Completely different senses. But there must be some underlying connection between those two in them because they always go together. And the same thing with the uh, colors of the, uh, the soapy feel that we get from these cleaning materials and the fact that these all turn green except for this one, which is yellow. And what these have in common is that they're all acids. I won't go into what the chemical uh, nature of an acid is. And these are all alkalis, or like we chemists like to refer to them as bases. But I have found in my everyday conversations, if I tell somebody who's not a chemist it's a base, uh, they'll think of something else. A musician will think of one thing and another way. But these two are related to each other, acids and bases. Let's see, I want the one which is from the milk of magnesia, which is this one. I can tell it's the milk of magnesia because it's cloudy, just like the milk of magnesia. Milk of magnesia bottle says on it that it is an antacid. What that means is it is anti-acid. It means it uses up acid. So let's take some acid from over here, add it, and see what happens to the color. Sure enough. This is acid, turns it pink, but not for very long. As this begins to dissolve, 
It begins to react with the acid. It gets rid of the acid, and it goes back to being the alkali that it is directly out of the bottle. So you can see this is a nice way of determining whether something is an acid or a base. Uh, and there are uh, a tech, can I? I have a slide I'd like to show. We chemists refer to these uh, acidity or basicity in terms of pH. It's something you may probably have heard of. And the red cabbage gives a nice range of colors. It's very good for using color to determine the pH of something. But even better is if you buy a commercial product for it, because then you don't get all that other stuff, and you don't have to smell cabbages, and you don't need a blender, and all the rest of it. But you can tell that the substance that is used in these, this particular commercial product is not the same one that comes from the red cabbage. How can you tell? Look at the color range. It's got green in the middle and then blue, and then it stays blue all the way to the end. Never goes yellow. So these are ways in which chemists use color. And uh, uh, let's see, one more. Do I have time? No. 30 seconds. I don't have enough time. Thank you for your <laughs> Okay, good evening. Um, so I'm now going to try to tell you a little bit about what we know about some of the phenomena that, that uh, Dr. Gilbert showed you earlier. Uh, color is actually kind of still a mysterious uh, um, perception. Uh, we don't know a lot about the mysteries that uh, Pupa showed you, and I'll touch upon some of those. So uh, first, just to say that um, you know the, the course of visible light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, and you've seen how with the prism you can break down white light into its uh, component parts, from blue on the on the short wavelength to red on the long wavelength side. So of course um, we detect light by using the retina, in particular the transduction of light energy into electrical signals by the uh, photoreceptors in the retina. So the photoreceptors in the retina, as um, Pupa already mentioned, uh, uh, consists of two types of photoreceptors, rods and cones. And cones, in particular, come in three different flavors, as she, she already showed you. Um, and note that uh, in, this di whoops, in this diagram of the, uh, the cross-section of the eye, you see the light coming through, uh, through the the cornea and then the lens and through the vitreous that um, makes up the bulk of the eye and strikes the retina, which is this thin portion uh, way back at the back of the eye. And then this is a blow up of the retina and the photoreceptors, rods and cones, are way back here against the back edge of the retina. And curiously, um, notice that light as it comes through, uh, through the eye and through the retina doesn't strike the photoreceptors first. Right? It goes through the other elements in the, in the uh, retina, and that will have a con an interesting consequence, as we'll see. OK, so a little bit about rods and cones. Uh, you can see why they're so named. Rods tend to be long and rod-like. Cones tend to be a bit more uh, triangular-shaped uh, and, and a bit shorter. Um, 
as I indicated, the light in this diagram, the light is coming from below uh, to strike the the um, transduction occurs out here in the outer segments of the rods and cones. Uh, and then the neural signals transmitted to the other elements in the retina, which are in this diagram not shown, but are in the bottom of the slide. Right? So just let's just summarize what we know about the differences between rods and cones. Uh, rods are important for night vision. When you go out at night right now, particularly if there's no street light, you're using your rods. Uh, cones are active in, in uh, daylight. Um, and that's because they have relatively high threshold. They aren't activated by low levels of light. Uh, rods have a very low threshold. In fact, it's been discovered that uh, rods, the, the rods in your retina are basically about as sensitive as they could possibly be because they will respond to a single photon of light. Right? So, so a single photon of light uh, will activate a, uh, a rod if, if it strikes it. Uh, so. Um, as you know, when you go out at night, uh, color disappears, right? There's no color vision at night. Uh, you can still see shapes in your bedroom at night when you turn the light off, right? You can still make out, especially if there's a little moonlight, you can still make out the furniture, but there's no color until you turn on the, turn on the light. Uh, color needs high, higher levels of light. Um, the super high threshold of rod vision, being sensitive to a single photon, uh, also makes it a relatively slow process. Uh, so rods, the response of rods is much slower than that of cones. How do we know that? That's usually tested by something called click, uh, critical flicker fusion frequency. So if you take a light and, and, and turn it on and off uh, rapidly, uh, when it, of course, if, you, if it's turned on and off slowly, you can see it going on and off, but as you increase the speed of that uh, flicker, eventually it fuses and looks like a continuous light, right? Critical flicker fusion of rods is at a relatively low frequency, 20 hertz. So if you're turning it on and off about 20 hertz, the, the, that dim light will now appear to be uh, continuous. Uh, at 20 hertz, if you're stimulating the cones, that it'll still appear to be blinking. You have to turn that up to 50 hertz. Right? Uh, this has an interesting practical consequence. Um, anybody think of what, why this is important in our daily lives? What what instruments do we look at, which are actually flickering? Computer screens, TVs, right? Those TV uh, images are actually flickering at 60 hertz. Why 60 hertz? Because they, you want to be beyond the critical flicker fusion of, of uh, cones so that what, what, you know, it looks continuous rather than flickering. Right? So that's set by this critical flicker fusion frequency. And as we'll see, rods are predominantly important for peripheral vision, that is vision off to the side, whereas cones vision is pre predominantly at the fovea, that is the center of gaze. Where, wherever your eye is looking, when you were looking at uh, Pupa's X on the American flag, that you were putting your fovea right on that X, right? Um, and, be, and because, as we'll see, the density of cones is ex very high at the fovea, that leads to a very high acuity. Acuity is usually measured by putting up Two points, of, two points of light and seeing how close they can come before you report that it looks like one spot rather than two, right? So that's, that's the spatial acuity. Spatial acuity is much higher in the center at the fovea than it is in peripheral vision. Um, so um, the visual system has an uh, extraordinarily wide dynamic range. That is to say, we're sensitive to, uh, on the low end, um, a, in, in this uh, diagram, six log units uh, beyond sort of the center here. Up at the high end where the light is so high, you're, you're possibly damaging your retina, you're up to seven to eight log units, positive seven to eight log units. So you can see the total uh, range is somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 or 13 log units, where a log unit is a 10 times multiplication of the intensity. Right? And 
as, as we indicated earlier, we use rods in this low uh, light level situation. We use cones in the high light level, and there is some overlap. Uh, and if you're a psychophysicist, you talk about scotopic vision being night vision, photopic vision, day vision, and there's sort of this middle ground mesopic where we're using a uh, combination of both rods and cones. Now remember this slide I showed you earlier that indicated how um, the, there's a consequence to the receptors um, being the last in the chain here to receive the light. So the neural processing goes from the rods and cones to the bipolar cells, which are the cells right here, to the ganglion cells, which are the cells here. The ganglion cells then carry this information into the brain, right? So they have wires, we call them axons. These wires carry that information to the brain, and you can see them right here, right? And they gather, those, those axons of the retinal ganglion cells gather out here uh, in, the, in the, in fact, they're the first element in the retina that, that uh, the light contacts, right? And they gather together and exit the brain right here at the a structure known as the optic nerve. Okay? Now, what's the consequence of this? If we see a cross section of the optic nerve here, we can see the axons of the ganglion cells here in these lightly colored um, in this trace. Here is the axons of the optic nerve uh, leaving. And because the, all these axons are leaving here, look at, at this point in the optic nerve, there are no photoreceptors. There's no retina right here because these axons take up space and they, when they leave, they, they take up that space that the, the uh, um, retina would normally uh, have there. So that creates a blind spot. So we are all walking around in everyday life with two blind spots, one in each eye, right? And I dare say most of you, if you haven't uh, had that blind spot demonstrated to you, you probably didn't know that it exists, right? But it's actually a pretty easy demonstration to show. Uh, so there's a, the blind spot is in the nasal part of the retina, that is the part of the retina near the nose. So because the reversal of image in the, in the lens, the blind spot in my right eye is on this side. So if I look straight ahead, if I put my finger straight ahead like this, and then I bring my other hand over here. If I get it to right here, the tip of my finger disappears. So that, so you can try that. So um, close your left eye, look with your right eye, put your left hand out straight ahead, and then move that right finger back and forth, keeping, keeping your gaze on your left finger. And at some point, the image of that, that your right, finger will disappear, right? That's a blind spot. We walk around with two blind spots, one in each eye every day, and we hardly know about it, right? Uh, so it's, ra it's rather, rather remarkable. The brain compensates for that blind spot in kind of mysterious ways. Okay, now let's look at the distribution of rods and cones across the retina. So here's a plot of the retina from uh, nasal to temporal, you can see here's the optic disc, the blind spot, no, no rods or cones there. The distribution of rods is shown by the purple and the distribution of cones by green. You can see that cones are, um, in, in mammals, uh, in um, primates, there are no rods right at the fovea. It's a cone-only um, fovea. And you can see here, cones are shown in green, rods in purple. You can see they're right at the, at the narrow por por portion of the fovea, there are no, there are only cones, no rods. If you get off the uh, fovea a little bit, then you start to see the, the rods. And if you get out very peripheral, the rods actually predominate, right? Uh, and this is, notice that the peak density of rods is, is 15 or 20 degrees peripheral to the fovea. This, this is a explanation for the, I think, commonly known fact that if you're out stargazing and want to look at a very dim light, very dim star, you, the best way to see is not to look directly at it, but look slightly off to the side, because in that situation, you're using rods. You want to, pla whoops, you want to place your, your rod, the peak, peak distribution of rods onto, the, onto that dim light in order to see that. Okay, so um, 
The, here's, a, here's that repeat of that distribution of the rods and cones. And here you can see a schematic diagram of the connections of the other elements in the retina at the, centr at the fovea, central retina, and at the periphery. And notice here, um, so, he so here are the photoreceptors, right? And the other elements in the retina. So let's, let's just look at the uh, ganglion cells, which are these cells right here. So notice that at the central retina, there's a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one relationship between the cones and the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells, right? So each cone in the, at the fovea has a private line into the ganglion cells. These are known as midget ganglion cells and midget bipolar cells. Uh, and of course, that private line gives the fovea very high acuity, right? Out here, we, this ganglion cell is receiving input ultimately from many uh, rods and cones. So if a light strikes this rod, uh, this ganglion cell doesn't know whether this rod was activated or this rod was activated, right? So that's the, that's the reason why our acuity is poor, much poorer out here in the periphery than it is at central retina. And remarkably, 70%, um, you know, almost two-thirds of the, um, of the um, uh, ganglion cells that make up the optic nerve are of this midget type. In other words, 70% of our vision is devoted to the phobia, right? Uh, and of course, we don't look out there. It, perceptually, we don't see a very, very uh, clear central vision with, with very um, distorted or, or low acuity peripheral vision, right? We don't have the sense that we're looking, we have tunnel vision. Some, some politicians may have tunnel vision, but we don't, right? It doesn't appear to be tunnel vision. And yet, this says that we should, and, and the reason we, we don't have it is because we have a very uh, extraordinarily sensitive and accurate ocular motor system. If you're looking out there and you see something interesting over here, you don't try to look at it with your peripheral vision, you point your eyes to it, right? You put your fovea onto it. Okay, so now let's talk about the uh, color vision. So you can see here, the, this is, you, you're showing this already, uh, here the, the same uh, graph that Pufa showed you, except here uh, they've been normalized so to 100, so each of the, the cone pigments are normalized to, a, to 100%. Uh, and I wanna just talk a little bit about the organization of the, um, of the retinal ganglion cells. And you can see these other elements in the, in the retina, and I just wanna say uh, two general principles. There's, there's a general principle of the a vertical system here uh, involving the photoreceptors, the bipolar cells, and the ganglion cells. We've already talked about that. But we haven't mentioned these other uh, horizontally uh, arrayed elements in the retina, the so-called so horizontal cells and amacrine cells. So, so these two, this horizontal system is responsible for the surround of uh, of the receptive field of the ganglion cell, whereas the vertical system is, is the center, and I'll illustrate that by this movie. So what we're seeing here is actually a classical movie made by Hubo and Weasel, who won the Nobel Prize for this work, uh, along with a, a, a large body of work. So what we're doing is we're looking at a screen in which they're gonna shine spots of light over the audio, I hopefully you'll hear the spikes, the action potentials that the retinal ganglion cell resp uh, res in response to those spots of light. And the game here is to try to figure out what is it that makes that retinal ganglion cell respond and what is it that uh, makes it not respond. So. So, so Matt, this is just a cat. Actually, is, the recording is made from the retinal ganglion cells in that cat. So you can see when the light is placed right here, it's very effective in driving the cell when it's turned on. When you put a dark spot there, the cell responds when, you, when that annulus of light turns off. Right? So this is referred to uh, an on-center off surround cell because it's turned on by light in the center and it's turned off by um, by by light in the surround. Right. So um, you can see here they are testing with bars of light. So it turns out that 
This is these uh, center surround organization of the retinal ganglion cells. It's what you see in the retinal ganglion cells coming out of the retina. But when you go up into the visual cortex, the organization changes um, so that now, rather than having receptive fields that are circular, now they're elongated. So now the optimal stimulus is actually a bar of light or a bar of dark. And it has to be oriented in just the right way. Um, so here's so here's a schematic of the of these on and in addition to the on center cells, there are also off center cells, exactly the opposite. And there are 50 uh, fifty percent of the cells are on center, fifty percent are off center. So on center cells respond when a spot of light is placed in the center. Off center cells turn off when a spot of light is placed in the center. And here's here are the receptive fields in the cortex, right? So this is transformed from the retinal ganglion cells coming out of the eye. By the time they get to the cortex, now the receptive fields are elongated. So now the optimal uh, stimulus is a, is a bar of light. And the, the way we get to color is, so what I just told you is really the system for, uh, for, the, for the rod system. For the color system, you also have this center surround organization but now the an antagonism, so to speak, is between colors. So you have cells that have a red on and a green off surround. Or you have the opposite. You have a red off with a green on surround. And, um, and then you can also have green on with a red off and green off with a red on. Uh, and similarly, you have the same classes for the other pairs of complementary colors, blue and yellow, right? So you have blue on, yellow off, blue off, yellow on, and so on, right? So this partially explains the, the demo that Pupa showed you of how, why the surround of, a, of an object is partially determining the perceived color of it, right? Uh, and this is essentially the same demonstration she showed you that the same, so here in this demonstration, these two spots are actually the same color, but they're perceived quite differently, right? Because we interpret this as being in shadow. Uh, conversely, these two spots are very different colors, and yet when you look at them in this context, they, they look the same, right? So this is a phenomenon known as color constancy. Uh, so, partially explains, again, the paradox of why the physical spectra do not equal our perceived color, right? And part of this is because we're, the, the, our brains are trying to maintain color constancy. And the, the best example I can give for this is if you, if you do any digital photography, if you have a digital camera, you know there's a color balance, right? If you're taking uh, um, photographs in bright sunlight, and then you come into this room with incandescent light, you're supposed to change the color balance. If you don't, then white, a white shirt will appear very differently under bright sunlight than it does under, under this illumination or any other different illumination. And yet, we know from personal experience, we don't, we don't have that problem, right? White shirts look white, regardless of whether it's under uh, what illumination it's under. So that's the color constancy. So the visual system is being is is smarter than our digital cameras, believe it or not. Right? It's able to maintain that color constancy even even in the face of very different uh, illumination. Okay. So the final thing I want to talk uh, about is color blindness. Um, so you have all heard about this phenomenon, right? So color blindness is basically a problem in one or more of the cone pigments, the three cone pigments that, that uh, are responsible for color vision. Uh, most commonly is red-green blindness. So some problem with either the red cones, or that, that is the, um, the long wavelength cones, or the green or middle um, medium wavelength cones. So um, it turns out that color blindness is much more common in males, about 8% of the, the population of, uh, are, are colorblind, whereas in females this is um, it's less than one percent, and the reason for that is because the both the, the the genes for red and green pigments are both uh, 
recessive and are on the, on the sex-linked chromosome, on the X chromosome. And because males have only a single version of that, right, whereas females have both, so females are colorblind only if both X chromosomes are defective. Males are, are colorblind if, if um, they inherited a defective chromosome from their mother who may not have shown colorblindness. Right? So the, the, this is a famous um, a test for colorblindness. So uh, in this, in this uh, population, I'd expect a couple, particularly males, to, to be colorblind. So I see 74 here. Uh, anybody who doesn't see 74? And, and are, you, are you colorblind? You, you are. Okay. What do you see? 21, right. So you're, you're red, green, um, colorblind. Um, so, um, and here I see a 42. Anybody not see a 42? And what do you, what do you see? No pattern. No pattern. Okay. So uh, I think this is a test for um, for the blue blue cone uh, anomaly, which is actually more, more rare than the than the red green color blindness. Uh, and finally, um, the the term color blindness implies that those individuals are blind to color, but actually that's not true. Uh, so this is a simulation of what a normal scene uh, a scene. Uh, would look like under normal for normal individuals, uh, and then an individual without the, the long wavelength cones, or without the middle wavelength cones, or without the short wavelength cones. So you can see, um, and, and of course, one can never be sure that the red that I see is exactly the same as the red that you see, right? This is a, and you, it, can, it has to be tested rather strenuously with psychophysical uh, tests in order to, to determine that. Uh, but this is a, a, a simulation of that. And you, and you can see that there are certain objects on here uh, which are easily discriminable for the normals, which are not e easily discriminable but in, in one of the pathological conditions. OK, so that's, um, that's all I have. And Um, now we're going to switch gears here a little bit, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, an expressive use of color in painting. And I deliberately brought actual paintings on paper so that I hope that you can come up afterwards and I can show you some of this of what I, I will explain. It might not be quite so obvious in the translation on the slide. Um, Couple things to know about color and painting. A little bit of a contradiction with color and light um, is that, okay, hue or the name of a color and also the amount of a color, the lightness and darkness of a color or value, intensity or brightness and dullness of a color. In painting, we talk about warm versus cool in color and complementary colors, which is related to warm and cool. And I'll point out various things that I'm doing with this project. In particular, it is a book project that I'm doing with um, Susan Bernstein, an English professor. And what we're doing is we're studying maybe tw 20 to 25 women, say from the last 200 years that we think have been overlooked for their um, contributions to science and culture, sports, music. And so we just started the project. <clears throat> so I won't talk too much about the women, but they're basically portraits. Uh, Susan Bernstein will be writing creative nonfiction, and we're working collaboratively on, the, on these pieces. So this first woman was Lucy Evelyn Ch Ch Cheeseman. She's a British, she was a British entomologist. And um, I work from, in some in, in cases with these women, 
uh, the photos are black and white grainy photos that I can find online, which is fine, because then I can make up the color. Um, I will do some more contemporary women, and then I'm faced with, well, I have a color photograph. Do I make the color like that, or do I make it different? Um, and I've been really, in this body of work, I use a lot of line work. This is flash, which is an opaque wash. And I love the velvety quality that you get with the color. And it doesn't shine, so you, what, what you see is really what you get. So I hopefully, hopefully you'll come up and look at that later. Um, let's see, where do I need to be here? Because I want to point some things out. OK, so in line work is, is great in painting, because thin strips of color um, allow maximum things to happen on the things happen on the edges of color where colors touch each other. So I deliberately play with value and uh, complementary colors, a relative warm and cool of colors. I've played around with with when I'm with flesh tones. I've used red as an outline color, which you know it has to be a very powerful red. Otherwise, it's too similar to the warm color of flesh. It doesn't work as well. Blue is good because it's very contrasty, because flesh is kind of orange. I like green. So lately, I've been using green as my, my contrasting color for kind of white people. Um, since this portrait had a lot of busyness with the butterflies in the middle, I just concentrated on making a kind of just bold um, framework, for, for, better, for lack of a better way to, to put it, um, to play with my color. So here, when you see this later, like this is an area of maximum. This is basically red and green, but it's, it's kind of a red-orange. And what we talk about in painting is something called optical mixing. And this was a little bit, I think Pupa was talking about it, and I think someone else mentioned a version of this. Um, and the way we talk about it is, we say that since this is a kind of, it's green, but it's on the more yellow side, and that is red, but on the more orange side, they both have yellow in them. So when you, you make thin strips of those two colors and put them together, your eye sees, brings out the yellow, because they both, both of the colors have yellow in them. So we just talk about it in a different way. But um, hopefully, when you can come up later, and you can, if you stare at this for a while, you can really see yellow. Um, not, well, I guess in the out here you can see it too. It looks like yellow. So, it, but that's a d different issue up there, I think. Um, okay, so maybe that's things like this. Okay, blue and green are analogous colors. Not so exciting, but I would say it's still it's they're interesting to put together, and it's still more interesting than maybe just making one color that's blue green. So enough about that one. Oh, I, I, sh I guess I should have mentioned uh, uh, about Lucy Evelyn Cheesman. She wanted to be a veterinary surgeon. And this was in the early part of the 20th century. And she was British, and she wasn't allowed to, to study that. So she became an entomologist. And this woman is Hannah Marie Wormington. She um, was an archaeologist and an anthropologist. And she was the first woman to receive a PhD in 1954 from Harvard, although as she was working towards her PhD, in one instance, um, what I read about her was that uh, she was taking notes in a lecture hall, and the professor asked her to sit out in the hall and take notes, and um, this was in the 50s. So interesting things that you find out about various people and what they've done, um, and this is in the 50s. So this relates more to her anthropological work. And I found this wonderful picture of her with these birds. And I also have a fondness for insects and frogs. One thing about being an artist, you can paint whatever you want, really. <laughs> and so sometimes this, it's not that logical, but in some cases, it is. So, um, um, so what I think, what, what hopefully is interesting to the viewer about this piece is, in addition to my use of flat color, I paint some things that are kind of more representational, but I still put some sort of bold outline in them to kind of just make them more visually interesting, I think. Like, for instance, mushrooms are just kind of brown and tan, but if you surround them with a, with a bright blue 
um, outline, it makes them pop. The same with a green, um, a yellow green frog, put some orange lines around him. He's a little bit more interesting. So I did a little bit more with the border work in the same with the Lucy Cheeseman piece. Um, you get considerable vibration here with the blue and the red orange because they're near complements and because both colors are fairly intense um, and close in value. So when you have all those things happening, that's also when you get maximum vibration in a color. Um, what else about this one can I po point out? Sometimes just extreme value, very a light yellow, a gray. Um, maybe that's, that's it for that one. So as this series keeps developing, um, I'm using more and more narrative elements in the border. I don't know if they'll, they will stay like this. They'll be portraits. For now, the, I'm using the narrative elements as part of the border. And as you see, they started off very simple, but the portrait was more complex. So this is Lydia Becker, and she was a British botanist worked in the, the middle, around the middle of the 19th century. And she was one of the, uh, a number of women who worked with Charles Darwin, and she sent, they would send, uh, another woman was Mary Treat, she was an um, entomologist, send their research to Darwin, do a lot of the field work, and, and they worked with him in that way. Um, she mostly worked on hermaphroditic plants, which apparently isn't that uncommon, one of the plants that she particularly studies, the red campion, which is a British wildflower, and that's here in the border. Um, another a kind of, a, a, say, a t uh, tool or something that I use in painting is, okay, I, I wanted, I knew I needed the red campion because that was the flower that she spent most of her time studying, but to just put the flower in the border it really wasn't that exciting. So I put these ovals of black underneath. Black does wonders for color. It just makes colors pop. Um, what else? Oh, when I talked, I mentioned earlier the amount of color. Okay, so I just had, she, I don't, I think I had an etching, black and white etching of, there weren't many pictures of her because her, most of, she lived more, bef uh, most of her work was and be before photography. So. She had this beautiful dress on, though, so I decided to make it blue. So I'm using green and blue lines in here. And then she had this wonderful hat on, so I, this is the same light blue and dark blue here, but because it is, the line work is in red, obviously from a, dis, from a distance it looks like, it looks very violet here, but they're the same. So you, you talked a little bit about how color is perceived depending on what's around it. So that's, that's an example of that. Um, also say, uh, things like, well, in, in, the, in relating to her life story, her father was a calico designer in the 19th century. So I thought, oh, that's beautiful because I can find some examples of British calico and use that in the border because I love pattern. And so that's what I did. So these are painted from actual examples from British calicos. So even in doing something like that, I'm thinking about color. Obviously, when I have this much blue, I'm not going to use much more blue in this piece. But for the corners, I thought, yeah, I could still use a little, a little bit of blue, and make, and I balance it with a darker, the reds here, red and green, and then these are the two lighter corners. But I made sure that they were opposite in coolness, also. Um, other than that, and this again is another example of like some more realistically painted creatures but with bright color for pop. And a little fluorescent color here too, adds some pizzazz. So um, if you want to see more of my work, I have 26 works on paper up at the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art until January 4th. And I really would like to invite you to come up afterwards and take a look at this uh, in a more close up. Thank you.
All I can tell you is, now that I see what our eyes and brains are doing all the time, seeing all this color, interpreting it, it's no wonder I'm so tired all the time. <laughs> it's a very busy process. Thank you so much to the scientists and artists uh, for clarifying that. And I know that many of our talks here at Soundwaves provide a glimpse into a topic that's very much more complicated. And I just, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but this is a university where there is so much information available, so many public lectures. Hopefully this will get you interested in a topic and you'll go check out what's happening in all our millions of great science departments. But we have a different topic now. I'm gonna speak very briefly and the reason I'm gonna be speaking so briefly is that my topic is absolutely absurd. It has no answers. What does sound, what color is sound? What does color sound like? And the answer is that that question makes no sense. So let me rephrase it into a different question, which I will then not answer. <laughs> so here's the setup. You can take a picture of a piece of fruit. You can take a picture of an orange, which is a great thing to take a picture of because not only is it a piece of fruit, but it's a piece of fruit that's named for its color. And now put that picture into Photoshop and drain all the color out so it becomes a black and white picture, okay? And I hand you, the gentleman in the yellow sweater, this picture, and what are you gonna say it's a picture of when you look at that black and white picture? Answer, you're gonna say it's a picture of an orange. You know it's an orange, even though it's not orange, right? So my question, which I can't answer is, is there an equivalent process for musical color? And so give me a few minutes to not answer that question. Let me start by playing you two short clips of some music. And what interests me about these, I think in the first one you'll recognize the instrument, but it may be that you won't recognize it right away. It certainly doesn't sound very much like this instrument. I think it's an amazing, amazing sound, and this is one of my favorite musicians. It's an old recording, I believe from the 40s, so pardon the low fidelity. Uh-oh, I don't have any sound. Well, this experiment may not work. I'm not getting any sound. No, but I'm not hearing it go choop, 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 choop. Oh. There, no? All right, we got technical difficulties. It's a live performance. So uh, let me tell you what I was gonna play for you. There is a wonderful flute player, now deceased, named Marcel Moise, who had, he, he died in the 90s, and he had a flute sound that was so compact. Notice I'm using the word compact here, we'll talk about that in a second. This sound is so compact that it sounds more like a violin than like a flute. The second example that I was gonna play is a jazz and rock trombone player who is playing so high, and notice I'm using the word high, he's playing so high it sounds like a trumpet. And if I had asked you what instrument was he playing, I'm pretty sure you would have all said he's playing the trumpet, and no he isn't, he's playing the trombone. And I think if you would listen to the flute player, and maybe one day, oh did you get it? Ah, now, well, now I've kind of had my thunder stolen. So it sounds like a flute, but you can kind of imagine a bow crossing a string. It's very direct, right? Notice I use that word direct, whatever that means. I'll point when the trombone player starts playing. There's a little introduction here.
What instrument is that, by the way? Harmonica? Great, great song by Captain Beefheart. So that definitely doesn't sound like a trombone, right? And it's very high. Now, so I describe that as high. Now, what kind of a word is high? Is that, I mean, we use that in music, but height is a, it's a sight word, right? So when we, when we say something is high, that's, it, it means it looks up here. We have to look up to see it. And when we say something is compact, that's a touch word, right? Something is compact if you try to squeeze it and you can't. So I was thinking about ways in which we describe musical sounds. Because musical tone, that's color. That's what we mean by color. I came up with a, a little list, and I want to read you some of them. Here's one part of my list. Shimmer, depth, dark, bright, lush, luminous. Right? What, what of our five senses am I riffing off of here. Sense of sight, right? Those are all sight words. OK. Pointed, tight, penetrating, harsh, smooth. What sense? Touch. Touch, exactly. And I could only think of one for this, but mellow. The mellow taste of our coffee product. That mellow is really a taste word. And the more I thought about it, I realized we have a very, very limited t vocabulary for speaking about sound. In fact, it's almost all metaphorical. So what I do in my spare time here at UW when I'm not preparing a sound waves event is I am the French horn professor, and I teach students every day how to play the French horn. So some of them are here today, and they will confirm this. I say to them, do you have an image of how you want to play this? An image. We don't have a word, a sonage. There's no word that describes a sound in our imagination. So we have to rely on our sense of sight, an image. And when we play, we try to hold something in our brain that is a picture of a sound. And that's something that's very, very hard to do. Now, if I asked all of you, imagine, uh, there it is again, imagine, right? Imagine meaning make an image of, imagine the sound of a viola. Imagine the sound of a piano. You can probably get that in your head, right? How about imagining the sound of this instrument? You probably can't. I would virtually guarantee that you've never heard this instrument, because there's only one, and it's this one. <laughs> this is an instrument which I created, and I call it the Noriba. I'll tell you why afterwards if you want to come up and chat with me. But it's without this, this part of it is an Indian shanai, which is a double reed instrument like a sham or an oboe. Actually uses a quadruple reed. It has four reeds stacked, and it makes a very buzzing sound. Buzzing, interesting. We say buzzing, and that is kind of a sound word. We relate it to insects, buzzing. And then I play it with a French horn mouthpiece. So now, I put this purposefully where you could see it, and I've talked about it for just a minute. And now, I know there's one thing that you really want. Because when we talk about sound, it makes us want to hear sound, right? Which is an interesting thing about sound. So I will give you, why don't you first think about what this might sound like. I, you have no way of really guessing, right? But see if you can get an image in your head. as time goes by at the end there. <laughs> so what does that sound like? Can you describe it? Someone call something, call out a few adjectives. Muted. muted. OK, it's muted. And by muted, you mean it's kind of quiet. Yeah, yeah it's kind of quiet. Yeah. We do have loud and quiet as words that work. What else is it like? Dry. Dry. Interesting. Yes. Dr crisp. Interesting. Touch words. What else? Victorian. <laughs> Interesting.
Anybody else? Somebody said something like chalky. Chalky? Yeah. And what was the other one back there? Plastic. Interesting for an instrument made out of wood and metal. It, you see that it's, it's difficult to describe sound. And it gets even more difficult when sounds combine. Is it OK if I play your piano for just a little bit? Here's a note on the piano. Here's another one. By the way, would you say those are uh, the same note name or a different note name? Same note name. Isn't that very, you, were you going to say same? Yeah, same. Isn't that weird that we know that's the same note? They're so far apart, right? One is higher, one is lower. Interesting that we say higher and lower. Yes, they are both C's. Here's another note. Here's another note. When I play those notes together, the color is very different if I go like this and if I go like this. There's different colors created by different blendings of notes. So what color is that? It's, it's almost impossible to say. So now when it comes to listening to color, what advice can I offer you? And the answer is, I don't know, but heightened perception of what you're actually hearing, I think is the key to hearing music in, if you will, greater color. So now my question is, what about if we were able to take a black and white snapshot of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? What would we have? What is the color information? Is it the instruments? I don't think it's the instruments because, name this tune. You know what piece it is. We do lose some, in, some information information when we change instruments. If uh, the beginning of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony were played very quietly, <laughs> on the Noriba, you'd still know it was Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. So what are we really listening for? And the answer is really, and I know it's a cop out of an answer, but as you see, we can't talk, we don't have a vocabulary for talking about these things. So the answer really is, how much can you hear? Can you hear what instruments are playing? Can you hear what instruments are not playing? Can you hear, are there extra sounds beyond the ones that are being played? So there's an excellent, amazing kind of music that is from Central Asia, it's called throat singing. Some of, yeah, I hear that, mm, oh yeah, we like that. So the way you do it is you sing a very low note and you almost whistle with your lips. And can you hear there's something going up and coming back down again? There's something there that's a ghost of a sound, but it's there. Are there ghost sounds? Are there clarinets playing? Are there drums playing? Think about the four different ways that instruments can make a sound. They can strike. They can pluck, they can bow, and they can use air over a vibrating surface, right? Are you noticing which instruments are being played? Are you noticing how fast it is? Are you thinking of words like bright and dark and mellow and delicious and that feels good and that feels bad? Are you noticing when something feels bad? Does it feel bad on purpose because it feels so good when it stops? Or is it trying to make you feel bad? Is there an emotion that is somehow real life? Real life can be rough. Art can express that, right? Sometimes it's rough and it stays rough. Sometimes it's rough and then it clears. So opening our ears, again, a complete metaphor because there's no switch, but opening our ears to the panoply of sounds inside what is being played is the key to being a listener who enjoys more of the music and somehow becomes almost a, an active creator as they try to name the different emotions and the different sounds that are being created. And I want to turn things over now, because I know you want to hear some music now that we've been talking about it, to Todd Wellborn. And you are going to hear, I believe, some sounds that you are not used to hearing on a piano. And they're fantastic sounds. And I just love seeing such a big crowd. So thank you very much for coming. Come talk to us afterwards. Look at the art. 
ask us questions. We're here, and have a drink if it's still open. Okay, I'm going to talk about sound also, and uh, I want to just talk a little bit about the setup I've got here first, and then I'll talk about the piece itself. Uh, this is a regular piano. I could play, uh, well, you've already heard, it's a regular uh, piano. Uh, but it also has uh, a mechanism inside that uh, uh, tracks the which note is being played and how, f how fast, how loud it's being played. That information is just numbers. It gets turned into what's called MIDI. And through the little cord that comes out the bottom there, it goes into the computer. And I can do things with that. I, can, I actually have 88. Uh, triggers or buttons um, in terms of what the computer uh, sees. Uh, I also have a, uh, the computer, uh, which has some uh, particular music software um, on it called Max MSP. And it al I also have a live microphone that during the piece gets turned on and gets turned off at certain points. So there's some live processing uh, going on by the computer. And then I have, I just want to mention, because you'll all uh, wonder what I'm doing if I don't, uh, there's a thing called a piano bow. And I'm just going to put the microphone down a second and show you that. That's just fishing line with a little rosin on it, and I rub it past one of the strings, and uh, that creates a, a kind of electronic sound, actually. Uh, so the piece is actually um, uh, taken from a Chopin etude, which is uh, Opus 25, number 12, called the Ocean Wave Etude by Chopin. And uh, I uh, start out with a little uh, clip from it, um, and then because it's in C, and we already talked about C, um, uh, I, I mostly play, after that, I mostly play just Cs on the, on the piece. That's what I do. It's called Cscape. And so the, the, uh, the, the, the actual point of the piece is that I sort of take a snapshot. I stop in the middle of this Chopin piece and then explore up and down the, the sound that's in a C and all the different Cs that are on the, the piano. And uh, there's kind of like a set of, of, of variations, in a way, on just the note C. And what uh, is, uh, hasn't been mentioned, the word hasn't been mentioned yet, that's a French word uh, that means color. Uh, and it's the, the word timbre, uh, T-I-M-B-R-E. And uh, timbre is what distinguishes, allows us to distinguish uh, uh, between a uh, uh, noriba uh, sound, or a trumpet sound, or a clarinet sound, or my voice. They could all be playing the same fundamental pitch, but what the difference in the timbre is what's above that principal note. Uh, there are uh, notes within single notes, and I can demonstrate that too real easily. I was playing a very low note, this one. Inside that note is that higher note. It's hidden in there. That's what makes up the color or the distinguishing characteristic of any sound. It's the distribution of those uh, frequencies within the fundamental that makes uh, the uh, uh, difference between the uh, different sounds that we we hear. So that's uh, basically what this piece is about. It's about eight minutes long, so I'll um, uh, see if there's anything else I need to say. Uh, there's, some, there's a lot of computer processing. Some of the things are, are live, done live. Some of them are kind of canned. And uh, so I hope you enjoy Seascape.
thank you. I think that is what color sounds like. Thank you so much for coming. Please come back to our next program. It's on December 11th. And that is a Wednesday, which is unusual for sound waves, but that's a very crowded week, and that's when we were able to get the space. Right here, December 11th, uh, the last week of classes, 7 p.m., and our theme is newness. Newness, things that are new. We have a great lineup. I'll be playing some horn, and I hope to see you all at that event. Can everyone come up, please? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for coming.